Good day and uh, welcome to the uh, Twice Weekly Hockey Debates podcast. Today we'll be talking about, uh, as we do every Thursday, uh, betting in the NHL on, as the site is, the show, pardon me, is appropriately called, This Week in NHL Betting. As always, I'm joined by uh, Hall of Fame hockey writer Kevin Allen and uh, Sasha Peruk, the head odds maker for sportsbettingdime.com. And uh, we're going to talk about what's hot kind of on the NHL betting scene right now and uh, Sasha kind of had a bee in his bonnet over the Vesna Trophy odds that came out earlier this week, and uh, we're going to talk about that. Currently, the odds at midseason have reduced the number of netminders you can bet on to six, which seems to be a very short list this early in the season. Jordan Bennington of the St. Louis Blues is at number one, the favorite at plus 250. Then we go to Connor Hellebuck of the Winnipeg Jets, plus 300. Ben Bishop of the Dallas Stars is plus 400. Then there's a drop-off, Tuka Rask of Boston at 700. And Marc-Andre Fleury of uh, Vegas at plus 800. And then the longest shot on the board is uh, Semyon Varlamov of the New York Islanders at plus 2,500. And I know, Sasha, you felt there was a number of goalies that are being overlooked here. Who's the guy that you think is most missing from that list? Uh, the person that I would really love to see on that list right now is Kristen Jari of the Pittsburgh Penguins. He didn't play a lot at the start of the season because he was the backup of Matt Murray, but he's not the backup anymore. Um, and if you go back and you look at historical Vesna trends, or basically just the stats that Vesna winning goaltenders have accumulated over the years, um, if you're looking at the guys that are currently on the list, in particular the favorite, Jordan Bennington, he has a 2.53 goals against average and a 917 save percentage. No goalie has won the Vesna with a 2.53 goals against average or worse since Ed Belfour in 1993. And no goalie has won it with a 917 save percentage or worse since Martin Brodeur in 2003. Uh, going back to the lockout short, or sorry, no, going back to 1999, the worst goals against average has been 2.4 for a Vesna winner. And the worst save percentage has been 920. Um, wins are still a pretty crucial stat, and that's where Bennington is um, among the league leaders. It's taken at least 36 wins to win the Vesna every year since 1999, except for the walkout shortened season. Um, but the way that Kristen Jari has been playing, he's got 2.04 goals against the average, a 9.34 save percentage, and he's getting more and more starts. Um, so if there's one person that I would love to be able to bet on right now, uh, it would be him. And now, obviously, he was just added to the NHL All-Star game to replace the injured uh, Columbus netminder. Um, Kevin, we look at a guy like Bennington. Is this kind of uh, almost – it's similar to when Ken Dryden won the Conn Smythe in 71 and then won the Calder in 72, which a lot of people thought he necessarily wasn't the best rookie in the year, <laughs> but kind of uh, got a lot of love for his Stanley Cup play. Are we seeing the same kind of with Bennington because he did play so well in the playoffs and winning the cup last year, and a lot of people thought he kind of got jobbed and should have got the Smythe? Well, I, I think there is some spillover uh, a pos- in a positive way for him uh, by the way he played, um, and I think that you know, everyone just immediately put him among the elite-level goalies, which then always puts you, makes you a candidate um, for the Vezina as well. And uh, he certainly has uh, been good, and I agree with Sasha – with regard to wins is always an important factor, but you know, general managers historically have liked gaudy numbers. You know, they want to see their guy kind of stand out statistically uh, in addition to, you know, passing the eye test. And um, I I really think there's a couple of guys, three guys, uh, um, it, a lot will depend on the second half, but um, you know, Arizona has played very well. So Darcy Kemper, uh, depending on when, uh, uh, you know, his, how his injury healed. Uh, you know, he could be back in the mess. I'm really bullish on Tristan Jerry, and it's somewhat ironic considering they were considering trading him earlier in the year. Um, and uh, yet now, you know, he's the hottest goalie in the league in my mind. And, you know, it doesn't seem to be a flash in the pan. Like, uh, th- he's a very, you know, this is a guy that was considered a top prospect. And then, um, you know, it, it almost he almost like peaked too soon. Like he was he was considered such a hot prospect that they got a little disappointed in him for a while. Uh, now all of a sudden he's playing at a high level. And I also like Sam Sonoff. Now the problem with that is is that you have Braden Holtby, you know, in Washington who is a very well uh, established goalie. However, 
you know, Braden Holt, he is going to be an unrestricted free agent. And, you know, I don't know. I would assume he'll get re-signed in the offseason. But, you know, what if Washington starts to think, well, you know, maybe we'd be better off going with Samsonov. And, uh, you know, if that's the case, if they start think, thinking that, will they just uh, shift in midstream and start giving him the bulk of the starts? Uh, he's a very skilled goalie. Uh, and uh, that's a guy, too, that could come out of nowhere and uh, and be a factor. But, you know, the one thing that is true is that, you know, when the GMs um, are picking the winner, and they do, they like a track record to go with what uh, uh, um, they're doing uh, this season. So, I mean, I think the fact that, um, you know, you look at the names on there, the fact that Bennington won the cup last year, I think will will resonate with them for sure. So another name who's not on the list that uh, is Freddie Anderson of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Now, obviously, with the way Toronto plays, they give up a lot of scoring chances and ultimately give up a lot of goals. Does that work against Freddie? Is it too hard to win the Vesna when your team kind of plays that run and gun style? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, because as Kevin said, the voters want to see the gaudy statistics at the end of the year and Anderson's statistics are uh, 2.7 goals against average and save percentages even though it's getting sense. Um, and you mentioned Toronto's style of play is not conducive to limiting shots or limiting hiding two chances and even though he's only been pretty rock solid for them night in and night out his statistics are not going to be out there with even the benefits of the world let alone the worries and the campers and the that shows the way uh, Kevin, we've one of the things that's another interesting anomaly in those odds is the last five winners of the Vesna, none of them are even on the board. You can't bet on any of them. You mentioned Holtby, you know, guys like Carey Price and Sir Bobrovsky, you know, they're nowhere to be seen. Are, are we cha- seeing a changing of the guardians of the goal? Are we a younger new wave moving in? Yeah, I mean, one thing that needs to be brought up is is I think the way that coaches are now playing goaltenders uh, also sort of has changed the field a little bit. Um, you know, Tuka Rask, I think, has played pretty well this season, but, you know, he doesn't play as many games as you like to see in a visit and a trophy uh, candidate. And I think that's, um, you know, playing a, a role as, as everybody sort of cuts back on the, the game played by the veteran guys. And, you know, it's kind of opened it up for new for new guys. I mean, uh, you know, that's why uh, Tristan Jerry was able to get some opportunity, uh, and he took advantage of it, and you know, kind of seized the net. And uh, um, I think that's true for a lot of the veteran goalies; they're not playing as many games. And plus, a, a lot of the big name goalies aren't on the necessarily on the the top teams as well. Um, so, you know, like Montreal has had a very disappointing season. Bobrovsky. You know, he's been his own worst enemy. He simply hasn't played well. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I think for the most part, um, you know, what you see is what you get with the goalies, like the, the guys that have, are in the odds, the guys that have performed this well. But I think a few are missing, as we pointed out. Are we at the stage yet, Sasha, where you think we're talking about the NHL GMs are the ones who vote on this award? The writers have nothing to do with this one. It's the only one really that – the writers of the major awards that the writers have no say in. If you look at some of these goalies, they may not have the traditional gaudy numbers, but you look at their analytics, and guys like Hellebuck and Anderson have very good numbers in analytics. Do you think uh, we're yet at a stage where the GMs would base a Vesna winner on what their uh, analytics are? <laughs> Until I see it happen, I'm not going to trust in that when it comes to putting my own money down. Uh, until we start to see it end of the voting body, in the case the GMs start to value things like goal saves above average, um, it's not going to be something that I put on trust in. Uh, as I said, when I'm putting my own money down, I'm going to look at what historically the best new winners' statistics have looked like. And as I said before, I'm looking for some. I'm looking for a goalie who's going to finish the year with about a 925 sort of percentage. I'm looking for a goalie who's goal uh, points is under two and a half. Uh, and if that blames me at the end of the year, so be it. Um, you don't win every bet you make. But until I see the parameters of the Vesna winner change, I'm not going to put too much stock in it as analytics. 
as much as I do value that when it comes to making things like single game bets, um, when you're when you're wagering something like human beings, it's an entirely different analytical process uh, when it comes to figuring out where the best value is. So moving on, I'll oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add something. That, speaking of, um, you know, the human being factor, another factor in the Vezina voting that you know, should be considered is uh, the fact that there are only 31 votes. You know, when I was president of the Writers Association, when I first took over, um, you know, we only had, uh, um, you know, two uh, two votes. Uh, no, was it? No, it was three votes uh, per uh, team. Um uh, actually, it was, no, it was two votes per team. And so what ended up uh, happening in my mind was, is whenever we had, you know, one or two or three odd votes, as I would call them, you know, where you, you really didn't understand, like, what the writer was thinking when he made that vote, it really had an impact. Uh, and so I expanded the voting um, so that I could uh, shrink the margin of error. Uh, you know, I just felt if we, you know, I felt, first of all, we had more quality, uh, qualified voters than, we're voting, but more importantly, you know, if you had 120 people voting and you had two or three goofy ballots, it didn't have the impact that it did when you had 60 or 55 or 56. Well, that's true, still true with the Vezina voting. And I, you know, these GMs all kind of know what they're doing, but I've always had the impression that some of them sort of dash it off at the very end. And you, we've had some what I would call goofy votes. And so, I think you can have uh, a result that may not be represented simply because you had one, two, three, or four guys who just did it in a hurry, didn't pay much attention, and you know you end up if it's a close race, you know I think it, those kinds of things really impact it. So um, it, uh, when you have that few votes, I, I think you, you you're open to a non-representative vote depending on how much care. GMs uh, take in, in voting. You think there's any skullduggery that goes on behind the scenes, Kevin? I mean, if you're, your goalie's having a hot year and you're the GM and his contract's coming up, <laughs> you should call a few of your buddies in the GM community and say, you know, you know if I got to give this guy a big raise if he wins the Vez, it's going to blow my salary cap out of the water. You know, you scratch my back and someday I'll scratch yours. You think any of that goes on? I, I, I don't, but I, I may I might, might want to say yes just so I can say the word skullduggery. I, I think that was just a, 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 an excellent word. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't think so. Um, you know, I, I just don't. I mean, it is important. Obviously, it's a lot of money, but um, I would guess th these guys are so competitive uh, trying to win. I don't think they're, you know, calling in any favors from rival general managers. So that's just a guess. Though. I I've never really heard anything like that, and I cover, have covered the league for a long time. Now, moving on to another of the, the big NHL awards, the, the Hart Trophy debate uh, rages on, and uh, it always seems to me there's two camps when it comes to MVP awards. You look at a sport like baseball, and the MVP seems to be the guy that puts up the best stats. Now, hockey, if you read what it actually says on the Hart Trophy, it's supposed to go to the player that – is a judge to be the most valuable to his team. So I've always thought that should rule out anybody whose team doesn't make the playoffs because whether you were there or not, they were still going to miss the playoffs. So, But yet guys do win it that miss the playoffs. And we've got a guy that's, you know, we've talked a lot about the Edmonton Oilers and their long-term chances on this, this podcast. They seem to be bouncing back again. And certainly the big reason why is Connor McDavid now. I would think, in my opinion, if the Oilers make the playoffs, McDavid's got to be the favorite to win the Hart Trophy. But if the Oilers miss the playoffs, Sasha, should he still have a realistic chance to win? I, I don't think so. I agree with you. I think that the MVP could come from a playoff, a player who's on a playoff team. Um, as you said, that is the goal at the outset of the season to start with, is to get to the playoffs. Um, and there really isn't a very rich history of non-playoff uh, teams producing hard trophy winners. You have to go back to 87 88. Mario Lemieux uh, was the last player to win it on a non playoff team that year. He had 158 points in 77 games, 19 more than Brett. He gets 70 goals, just 14 more than anybody else. Um, so when it comes to betting on this award, you definitely want to be picking a player that you do think is going to be on a playoff team. 
Uh, I still don't think the Oilers are going to be a playoff team, as I said a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but if they do manage to sneak into the field, um, then I, I really think McDavid is basically a shoe in because as little history as there is of non playoff teams producing the Hart Trophy winner, there is a pretty rich history of teams that could fairly squeak in producing the Hart Trophy winner. Um, you think about a guy like Taylor Hall a couple of years ago, going back to 2002, you had Jose Theodore back up in the Canadian fairly into the playoffs. Um, so if this Oilers team, which I think everyone realizes is immensely flawed, is carried into the playoffs by Connor McDavid's heroics, then he has an extremely strong case. Well, when, you know, when I was president of the writers, uh, it really did bother me when uh, writers did apply their own set of rules uh, to the rules that we already have. And, you know, I, I don't know. I've yet to have anyone show me where it says that a someone that doesn't win the uh, – uh, or, uh, whose team does not uh, make the playoffs is ineligible to win. And yet I do know writers who think like that. And you just uh, articulated that itself. What I would say is, is that I think it certainly influences, and it should, um, what your voting is. But I, I don't like it. Like, you know, to me, y you can be the most valuable player. And if your team doesn't perform, um, you, know, what, you know, why should you be penalized for that? I mean, you can't help with the roster you're on. Um, and I've certainly seen guys that I thought were worthy to be named. Now, saying all that, you know, when I vote, I take it all into consideration, um, uh, in, in, including, you know, the impact the guy has had on his team. And because of that, you know, a guy like Nathan McKinnon, to me, um, you, know, uh, it, it, you know, I'm going to wait pretty heavily because this is an outstanding team, but McKinnon drives that team. You know, when I watch that team play, um, he's leading the charge. He's got the flag. He's carrying that. Everybody's following him. And, you know, I will factor that in heavily. <clears throat> but certainly, I wouldn't uh, rule out uh, uh, Nathan, uh, or excuse me, uh, Connor McDavid just because his team uh, doesn't make the playoffs. I just, I just don't think that's appropriate. I think there will be years when um, the MVP – um, you know, should be a guy uh, that uh, doesn't win the playoff if, if he warrants it. But I'm not sure it'll be this year just because of what I said uh, about Nathan McKinnon. Now, one thing about McDavid is, and in the age we live in where viral videos are so important in the daily scope of people's lives, certainly <laughs> Connor McDavid creates a lot of viral videos. And the goal he scored earlier this week was <clears throat> is everywhere. You can't uh, click on social media without seeing it five or six times pop up in your timeline. Sasha, do you think that plays a role? Do you think, you know, we, we're, we're a society that's fascinated by shiny objects. Is seeing him do stuff like that, that really very few players in the history of the game can do, do you think that is something that influences people when they're looking at an MVP? I think it probably is. Kevin can probably speak to that better, uh, being a voter. Um, I think it would help his case if it happened closer to the time of the vote, um, even, you know, sort of putting my amateur psychologist hat on. Um, I think that we are biased towards what we have seen most recently and the fact that he did it, uh, you know, four or five months before people are actually going to be putting pen to paper. Um, I don't think at the end of the year it's going to have a huge impact, but I think if you say it in game 81, uh, that it might, sure. I, you know, Sasha and I could hang out because I love practicing amateur psychology without a license. Uh, and I do think those videos have tremendous impact um, because they're memorable, for one thing. It, they're embedded in our memory. And I think the <clears throat> one thing that Kyra McDavid uh, does that is uh, that I think uh, writers are fascinated by is his ability to make incredible plays at incredible speed. Like, you know, there have been plenty of fast guys in NHL history, and now the game is faster than ever, and everybody skates like the wind. But, my gosh, he skates like the wind and can and make plays at such an incredible level and that I think it's hard not to uh, have that sort of influence uh, um, your thinking. And I think that is something that uh, sort of resonates for people. But saying all that, I would also say that, I always, you know, listen to the drumbeat uh, among writers if you, you know, read how, what they're writing about. And I do sense that <clears throat> Nathan McKinnon, uh, it, you know, has sort of risen in the last 
a uh, few weeks and everybody sort of looking at him. I don't know that I would call him the the player to beat, but I think he's on everybody's radar as a guy that if he keeps, you know, playing uh, at this level um, and all the other factors, including whether or not the others uh, make the playoffs win, and I think, you know, he's a guy that I think everybody would uh, um, vote for. And I think all the good videos that McDavid had wouldn't be enough if <clears throat> McDavid, if, um, uh, Nathan McKinnon continues to play at this level. Uh, I'm with you, Kevin. I think McKinnon's the guy, and that's who would get my vote if I had one. And one of the reasons why I really think he's the guy is earlier this season, two-thirds of his line, the top line on Colorado, Gabriel Landeskog and Miko Rantanen, were both out of the lineup injured. And he, as you say, he put that team on his back, and he carried them to where they are now and has kept them afloat when, you know, with a young team that didn't have a lot of uh, history of success that could have finished them. And he really kept them going and kept them right at the, you know, top of the central division. So I think, you know, that to me is what an MVP does. He steps his game up when they need him and, you know, the team's better for his presence. Now, Toronto, the media and up there is trying to make a case for Austin Matthews in the Hart Trophy. And uh, I don't know, I just, he was a guy who, he scores a lot of goals, but has Austin Matthews done enough, Sasha, to warrant uh, a place in the Hart Trophy discussion? I, I wouldn't put him nearly on the same level as uh, McKinnon and David. Mostly because you're always going to get the narrative with those two that they have not buried the team. And as you mentioned at the outset, uh, the definition of the Hart Trophy is a player who the most valuable to his team. And Matthews for me, it's surrounded by too much <clears throat> offensive talent to really consider him the driving force on sort of one of the best teams in the league. Now, the Leafs have been incredibly impressive under Sheldon Keefe. I think they have the best record in the NHL since he took over. But I still don't think they going to top the Atlantic, which I think we're going to talk about in a bit. Uh, I don't think he's going to catch after an accurate day ahead of the rest until he's the league goals. I don't think he's going to set himself apart in any particular area. Uh, and when you look at the Tavares, the Marners, the Nylanders, the Rileys, the world that are flanking him, you're going to be able to see the narrative that Matthews has been the most important player, the most valuable player to his team this year. Um, but as I mentioned, he also plays for the Maple Leaf, which isn't going to happen. Well, Matthews is playing for a Toronto team that is looking more like the team people thought they were going to be at the start of the season. You've seen both the Leafs and Tampa Bay kind of come back to life after really sluggish starts. You know, we've talked a lot about the Boston Bruins on this show and how we thought they were the team to beat, but all of a sudden uh, you know, they've had a lot of serious injuries and Boston's leaking a bit of oil and Toronto and Tampa are starting to make a move uh, who do you like in the Atlantic long term, Kevin? I, you know, I still like Boston. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I just think every season, even a really good team has to have, uh, you know, down periods. They got to go through injuries and so forth. But um, I, I, I just like the mental toughness of the Bruins, and I, I like their, uh, um, you know, they can do so much. Like I, I think their goaltending can steal a game for them. I think they can win it defensively. I think their offense is good enough. Um, they've got high character guys and they have depth. Like, you know, how many times last year did they, you know, bring up a guy from the minors and even in the playoffs, there were guys contributing that were not household names. And, you know, for that reason, I mean, I like the, the Maple Leafs as well, but their defense is simply not good enough, not, not for the postseason, uh, not, you know, when, you know, everybody's going to lower their goals against the, uh, average by a goal per game. I don't think they can do that. Uh, you know, there's, you know, Freddie Anderson is a good goaler, but you know he's just going to have uh, too many uh, quality scoring chances against him. Now, the team that I think uh, is, uh, you know, could be trouble for the Bruins, uh, you know, are the Tampa Bay Lightning. I mean, I, I'm very bullish on that team. I don't think we've seen the best of the Lightning yet. Um, I think they got a lot going as, as well, and you know, Vasilevsky, um, you know, hasn't been as good this season as he was. A year ago, and boy, if he gets really, really hot, then they'll be right there with the Bruins. Well, it seems like Mike Babcock 
Sasha was always trying to fit square pegs into round holes. He was trying to turn the Leafs into a team that they just didn't have the personnel to become. And it seems as if Sheldon Keefe, Babcock's replacement, has decided, well, these are the eggs I've got in my basket, and I'm just going to go with them and see if they break or they stay solid. And it, you know, it's it's working right now. But is the way Toronto plays, is it any chance it can be successful long term in the playoffs? I certainly think we're the fans. You know, we're watching an NHL that is sort of changing incrementally by the year. We still haven't seen playoff hockey. Uh, sort of turn into the more wide open, fast paced game that we're seeing in the regular season. We still see playoff hockey called differently in penalties, in particular in the later rounds. And the Leafs are not playing a style that is really conducive to winning um, in the postseason, as we've seen. They're not uh, sort of a, a grinding team that is going to be heavy on score deck. Uh, and that is something that is fighting. They are a very strong sort of puck possession team. They don't want to they'll, they'll keep possession in the neutral zone and they are they have the top end talent to capitalize on the numerous high danger chances that they create and they are willing to exchange high danger chances with you, reasoning that basically if we have better scores and a better goalie than most teams in the league that this work for us most nice. Um, but it's not a style of play as you mentioned that has really had a lot of success in the playoffs because the intensity has turned up because the game is called slightly differently. So if I was betting on an Atlantic team to win the Stanley Cup at this point, then I like, thought it would be taken through. Uh, because Tampa, to some extent, plays the same as that would be Toronto. Uh, whereas the Bruins, as we've seen most years, uh, call a style that is very conducive to making deep runs in the playoffs. Um, if I was betting on it to win the Atlantic division in the regular season, I would certainly be looking at the Tampa Bay Lightning. Um, as I've mentioned on the podcast before, I, I have always been hesitant to back the Lightning because their PDO, basically their save percentage and their shooting percentage over the last five years, has always been sort of top one, two, three in the league. And that's a statistic that is supposed to regress. But with Tampa Bay, it just doesn't. It just does not regress. Um, they score at an alarming rate based on the number of shots that they take, and they get basically great goaltending year after year. And I think the addition of Curtis McElhenney is a huge upgrade over Louis Manning in terms of a backup. Um, and now we look at the standings, they're only seven points back of Boston with two games in hand, and all of a sudden they have a goal differential that's only four behind Boston. And I don't really know how they do it except for the fact that that they have players like Samkos and Kucherov and Braden Point, people who put the puck in the net with the minimal, well, not minimal chances that they create, they put the puck in the net at basically a higher rate than any other team in the league. So there's, we're going to end on kind of a, a humorous note here. If people aren't aware of it, uh, Jordan Bennington, who we've been talking about as the Vesna Trophy favorite, he's all, obviously also been picked to the NHL All-Star game. And Bennington has thrown out a challenge to Canadian pop star Justin Bieber, who likes to fancy himself as a bit of a hockey player. Bennington has offered to let Bieber take 10 breakaways against him at the All-Star game. And Bennington is willing to give whatever amount Bieber wants to set to go to charity for every goal he scores. But Bieber must pay the same amount to charity for every save Bennington makes. Now, Bovada's come out with odds on this, and they're giving minus 350 against Bieber scoring a goal. So they're strongly believing Bennington will stop all 10 shots. And what do you think, Kevin? Can a pop star score on an all-star goalie? Nope. No chance. I'm I'm, I'm betting the, uh, on Bennington uh, in this one. Just I, Actually, I'm more betting against Bieber. Uh, I just don't believe that he's uh, – are going to score against an NHL goalie. I just can't believe that uh, his, despite the fact he's a hockey fan, that his skill level is high enough to get that accomplished. What about you, Sasha? Where are you putting your money? Can you I'm, even- not betting, I'm not betting on this. I don't, are there any sort of backroom deals that we don't know about here? You know, <laughs> maybe Bieber only agrees to this if he says to Bennington, okay, I'll do this, but you got to let me score one. 
So I am. this is a complete stay away from me because I don't know the motivations involved. I don't know how seriously anyone's going to be taking it. If I could, if I could bet with 100% confidence that Jordan Bennington is going to be, is going to try to save every single shot, then I would, I would not hesitate to lay three minus 350. I don't think there is a chance that Beaver scores on Jordan Bennington if Jordan Bennington is actually trying to make the save. Well, I'll give you a story to finish us off here. In 1971, there's a Canadian cult classic movie about the Toronto Maple Leafs called Face Off that was made. If you can ever find it on a DVD or come across it on a stream or whatever, it's a great movie. You got to watch it. Well, they they were filming it at Maple Leaf Gardens and Jacques Plante was the goaltender for the Maple Leaf set. And there was a scene, there was a, supposed to be a game against the Boston Bruins and Derek Sanderson was to score a breakaway goal on Plant after the, the star of the movie, who was a, a rookie defenseman with the Leafs, screws up to let Sanderson in the clear. Well, they don't, I don't know how many takes they did, but every time Plant would make the save. And the director would come down and explain to him, Jock, you understand the scene here. He has to score. And Jock would say, yeah, okay. And then they would do it again, and he would stop the shot again. Well, that's <laughs> the goalie mentality. You're not going to give up a goal, even if the script says give up a goal. So I would bet – the house that Bennington isn't going to let Justin Bieber score a goal. And I would take those minus 350 odds and I'd hammer them all day long because <laughs> I'm a goalie myself. And I know there's one thing goalies detest more than anything in the world. And that's seeing the puck in the net behind them. And they don't care who's shooting it. So that's my advice. It's This has been the uh, Hockey Debates This Week in NHL Betting Podcast. I hope you've all enjoyed it. Thanks to Kevin and Sasha for joining us. And uh, we'll be back again next Thursday. So. Tune in and then we'll give you some more betting tips. Thanks, guys.